Hi, this is David Harper of Bionic Turtle with a brief review of the contractually promised return on a loan as given by Anthony Saunders for FRM candidates. And what we have here is small k denotes the contractually promised return on a loan. You will recall this is not the expected return. This is greater than the expected return because the bank does not expect that the probability of repayment is 100%. So the promised return will be greater than the expected return. But still, in regard to the promised return, we have to calculate that. And as given by Anthony Saunders, here is the formula for that. It's a function of variables attached to the loan. And the numerator is the easier part. These are the revenues or receipts by the bank. So here I've input just some assumptions and the numerator you can see includes three components. First, the origination fee. So I'm assuming the bank charges one eighth a percent for processing the loan. Next, we have a base lending rate, which I've assumed eight percent and this typically approximates the bank's weighted average cost of capital. For a short-term loan, it could be the Fed funds rate or LIBOR. For a long-term loan, it might be the prime rate. Now, the bank needs to charge a margin on that to make a profit, and that margin is going to include the charge for credit risk. As we oftentimes say, expected losses are priced into the loan as a cost of doing business. So the margin includes that credit risk premium. I'm going to assume 1 and 7 eighths for the margin. So that means the effective interest or the interest rate charged to the borrower is 8% plus 1 and 7 eighths. And my numerator therefore includes all three components. So if I add those together, the bank is making an origination fee plus a base lending rate plus margin on top of that base lending rate. And in this case, that equals 10%. And so if we stopped there, the bank would be would have a contractually promised return of 10% on the loan. But we have a denominator here, and that reflects the compensating balance and the reserve requirement. So first, specifically, the compensating balance refers to the fact that typically the borrower is going to need to keep on deposit at the bank in the form of demand deposits some portion of the loan. I'm assuming here 10%. If the borrower has to keep part of the loan, really metaphorically in the bank's vault, this is going to increase the effective cost of the loan to the borrower and act as an additional source of return to the bank. So, for example, if I take 1 minus the compensating balance, 1 minus B, that's part right here, in this case I would have 90%, and so far, I'm leaving out the reserve requirement still, I would have 10% divided by 90% and you can see the compensating balance has acted to increase the promised return from 10% to 11.11%. Finally, the bank, just as an analogy, just as the customer needs to keep part of the loan on deposit with the bank, so does the bank need to keep a portion of its deposits with, as a balance with the Federal Reserve. And this is the reserve requirement. And so you can see here in the formula, it's doing, it's acting in the exact same way mathematically as the compensating balance is. It's in turn reducing the amount of additional return created by the compensating balance. So now I'll expand on now I'll expand on this formula here by saying 1 minus the compensating balance multiplied by 1 minus the reserve requirement. And now my denominator is 92% and my gross, my contractually promised return goes back down to 10.87, but it's still 
larger than the 10%. So now this 10.87 includes the impact of both the compensating balance and the reserve requirement. This is David Harper, The Bionic Turtle. Thanks for your time.